and to the fourth Zoom lecture of the semester. It is a great honor for me and for all of us at the ARU to welcome our today's invited speaker, perhaps the most dedicated attendee of our Zoom lecture series, Robert Cole, Emeritus Professor of Archaeology uh, and former Chair of the Department of Classical and Oriental Studies, Hunter College City University of New York. Professor Cole received his BA in Classics from Pomona College in 1974 and his PhD in Classical Archaeology from the University of Pennsylvania in 1982. A specialist in Minoan and Mycenaean culture, he has participated in excavations at Kergezer, the Kukunaries Hill on Paros, the Mycenaean Citadel at Gla, and on Crete at Comos and Psira. In his long academic career, he has earned numerous distinctions and awards and has served as an internal or external evaluator of a large number of doctoral dissertations and promotion committees. Currently, he serves as a staff specialist in Aegean culture on the excavations at, Tel at Hanna, ancient Alalak in Turkey, and has contributed to its publications. His volume on the Mycenaean pottery from the Kukunaries Hill on Paros was published in 2021 while in retirement. Cole plans to, con to continue his work by, introduce by producing a new book provisionally titled A Cultural History of the Aegean Bronze Age. He is the author of four other monographs, amongst which Serepta, Hill, uh, Serepta III, sorry, the imported bronze and Iron Age wares of areas, Area 2 and, and 10, uh, published in 1985, and Aegean Bronze Age Writer, published in 2006, and the editor of Amila, The Quest uh, for Excellence, published in two, 2013, and Studies in Aegean Art and Culture, published in 2016. Robert Cole has also published numerous articles uh, in scientific journals and specialized volumes on minor rites of passage, Bronze Age, zoomorphic vessels, and Mycenaean interconnections with the Levant. Before giving our virtual floor to Professor Cole, I would like to remind you to switch off your cameras and mute your microphones. Should you wish to address a question or comment to our speaker, feel free to use the chat button on Zoom. You may also, and I, I would like to encourage you to switch on your cameras after the end of the presentation to address your question directly to the speaker by raising your hand and unmuting your microphone. We are thrilled about tonight's public lecture, and we have been looking forward to hearing about the cult statue rendered on a Mycenaean crater from Cyprus. So thank you, Robert. Well, thank you, Thanasi, and thank you, Rania, for inviting me. And I have to say, these past two years of attending these lectures from the uh, Archaeological Research Unit from the University of Cyprus has been just a godsend for those of us who have been sequestered on account of this virus. And let's hope that someday we all get to meet in person. But in the meantime, it's nice to get to know everybody through cyberspace. So should we begin? OK, yes, um, so as you see, I'm about to talk about a, what I think is a cult statue rendered on a Mycenaean vase from Cyprus. The vase itself, whoops, let's see why. Okay. Uh, the vase is located in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Uh, certainly one of the great resources uh, for those of us who live in New York. I have been bringing students to the museum uh, since I started teaching at Hunter. Um, and and, and this, for those of you who aren't familiar with this photograph, this is what the Metropolitan Museum looked like in the 19th century at a time when the first director of the Metropolitan Museum was Luigi Palma de Cesnola. I, I suspect that many of you are familiar with the history of this, but um, in the event that those of you who don't know, Cesnola was the American consul on the island of Cyprus, and he was, let's say, inspired by Schliemann and feeling competitive with Onifalsch Richter and began digging like crazy all over the island of Cyprus and eventually accumulated a collection of 35,000 objects which he then tried to sell to various European museums uh, and found no takers. But fortunately for him, it was just when the Metropolitan Museum was being formed. And so the museum purchased his collection. 5,000 objects, by the way, were lost on a shipwreck, but 30,000 objects did come to the museum. And here you see uh, on the right, the earliest display of the Cypriot objects. And, he was named the director until uh, his death in 1904. 
since then, uh, in the 1970s, our own wonderful, great Vasos Kariorgis came to New York and spent several years reinstalling the collection, uh, bringing it up to modern standards and making Cypriot art uh, and artifacts something available to the general public that certainly they had no idea existed. And with that, he also produced this wonderful volume on ancient art from Cyprus. Well, the vase in question is actually not in the Cypriot gallery, which I understand is actually about to be redone. Um, but the vase is located in the Minoan and Mycenaean gallery in the Metropolitan Museum. And uh, although it was found uh, at Ayas Pariskevi in a tomb uh, near Nicosia by Chesnola, the vase, I must say, when I started bringing students to the museum, immediately caught my attention. And what immediately caught my attention was this figure uh, that, hold on one second, I have, let me hide these, ah, better. This figure that you see here um, that struck me as being really unusual and very unlike other Mycenaean figures that we see in Mycenaean pictorial pottery. And for a number of years, I've been thinking about it. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity today to talk about uh, how I, what I thought about this phase. Well, for one thing, let's just speak for a minute about the date. Um, for Mark, in his monumental study of Mycenaean pottery, did distinguish uh, although he didn't really speak much about the pictorial style, he did uh, distinguish typologically the shapes of the vases and observed that in late Helladic 3A or 3A2, which is uh, an early phase of the pictorial style, uh, the and the date being in the 14th century contemporary with the Amarna period, the Proportions of the vase were, uh, were, as we see on the left, they, the neck was low and the center of gravity was fairly high. Whereas in the next phase, the late Helladic 3B1 period uh, or the first half of the 13th century. And by the way, I place here uh, the terminology that was adopted by Kariorgis and Vermeule, the right pictorial style. We see that in fact, there is a change in the proportions. The neck is much higher and the center of gravity is lower. And so this clearly uh, indicates that the vase in question does belong to this phase to 3B phase or the 13th century. Well, as you can see, the vase itself um, is fairly standard in that it does have these two chariot scenes, which is fairly common. So uh, the first slide on the left shows one view with a chariot group. And uh, right behind that is the figure that we're gonna be talking about. Uh, under the handles, there is this very nice grouping of uh, floral motifs placed in a very organized fashion, all of them identical, just changing only in size. Uh, we can then go to the uh, opposite side of the vase where we see another rather standard looking chariot group. And then under the handle of the opposite side, we also again see a continuation of this very nice clustering of flowers, all very symmetrical, very carefully arranged and not really spread out uh, over the vase in the way that we often see it. Well, the vase itself was then studied by Sarah Imovar, one of the great pioneers of Mycenaean pictorial vase painting. She wrote an article on the pictorial pottery in the Metropolitan Museum. And the problem from the beginning dealing with this figure was its identification, uh, whether it represented a mortal or whether it represented a divinity or perhaps just some elaborate filling motif, which seems to really be the consensus of people who have studied the vase that it is nothing more than that. Let me just read to you some of the comments that Imavar made when she first uh, talked about the vase. She first of all questioned whether it should be reckoned with the figure, that is to say, um, whether this figure should be reckoned as an integral part of the pictorial composition uh, or another filling motif. Uh, in fact, Fourmark, and she followed Fourmark's opinion that uh, reading a narrative significance into the pictorial representations on the vase was probably incorrect. And in fact, he was very skeptical of reading any kind of narrative interpretations into the pictorial vases from Cyprus, primarily because of the formulaic nature of these chariot scenes that were so frequently re re uh, repeated. 
Um, she also noted that there was a resemblance uh, to the um, C figure. She said the upraised arm gesture, uh, which is common to Mycenaean figu uh, C figurines, um, suggested that it would seem to indicate that she is a goddess. And But she says though, whether a representation of the goddess herself or of some effigy of the goddess is debatable. And so she did in fact raise the possibility that it was a cult statue, but in fact uh, rejected that idea. She also uh, brought up some possibilities in terms of interpreting the, especially the upraised arm gesture and mentioned the warrior vase from Mycenae which she also uh, discounted. She argued against identifying it as an, uh, as an image of immortal women, uh, bidding farewell to her husband or her son. Um, and finally, she noted that, uh, well, let me just read to you. She says um, that through a curious uh, freak of fantasy and perhaps only half realizing what he was doing, the painter seems to have created this goddess by adding a human head to the popular 13th century decorative octopus pattern. And uh, here we see, in fact, uh, the types of ornaments that she believed that, in fact, the vase may, that this figure may have derived from. Uh, here we see the hybrid uh, voluted uh, flower form and off to the right, the uh, hybrid flower and octopus pattern, which he thought might have been the, um, the source of inspiration for this vase. I'd also mention that uh, several scholars, including Louise Steele, have considered the possibility that it does represent a mortal. And in fact, um, have suggested that it might represent a mourning figure. Um, there is, has often been for many years, this connection between mourning and death imagery on these vases, uh, primarily because most of them have been found in tombs on Cyprus. Although we know uh, certainly from the Near East and al Alaq, where I've been working for uh, over 20 years now, that large numbers of pictorial pottery were found in people's residences, were used uh, in their daily lives and not necessarily having any kind of connotations of uh, having to do with the funeral. And so she rejects the um, idea that they might actually, that this figure might represent a mourning figure, uh, as we see from the Larnax and from the uh, vase from Perati, mourning figures have their hands touching their heads. And this is certainly a reference to a gesture of hair pulling. And as we see our figure's hands stop at her chin, they don't go near the top of her head. Well, the next uh, scholars to take up this vase in question was Emily Vermeule and Vasos Kariorgis in their monumental volume of Mycenaean pictorial vase painting. And uh, they, analyzed uh, several aspects of the vase. One thing that they uh, paid close attention to were the floral decorations that we mentioned that exist under both handles. And if you compare these floral scenes to the floral ornamentation that we see on other Mycenaean vases, it's uh, a lot more on the other vases, more haphazard, more varied, uh, more random, let's say, whereas on this particular vase, it really does seem to form two very specific clusters. And in fact, Vermeul and, and Kariorgis um, attempted to identify the flowers, although they thought that this, this was a rather dubious exercise, but certainly the two palm trees, the three palm trees, sorry, on this one side are quite obvious and they fit very nicely with Fourmark's palm two type. Uh, the other tall flower on the right, um, might be a papyrus, the other two shorter flowers uh, might be lilies, uh, but this is entirely conjectural, primarily because they're all basically identical. They all have very much the same kind of uh, vertical lines uh, for the for the body of the, uh, the, the bottom part of the flower, and there's just uh, some variation in terms of the upper part. Uh, but as you could see, they all, uh, the, the vases besides the, the palm tree do have the uh, corona of dotted arcs. So um, again, they do seem to be fairly standardized. Um, 
And uh, again, here you can see the Mycenaean flower form that they suggested was the basis of inspiration for the figure. But as you can see, there are real differences. First of all, on the voluted flower, the volutes uh, face downward, whereas the volutes that form her breast, these two spirals uh, face upwards. And also on the, uh, the, the hybrid vases of the um, octopus hybrids, the, the links go downward rather than, uh, the tentacles move upward rather than, uh, downward rather than upward as we see on this figure here. I just wanna point out uh, one possible parallel for this figure if we're looking for floral decoration uh, inspiration, and that would be these rather columnar looking uh, plants that we see on this late Helladic 3A2 pictorial vase from Tel Dan, uh, which also has volutes and uh, a, a corona of um, dots, but it's the stalk that seems to have something in common in its uh, columnar-like uh, 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 appearance, and also perhaps even the horizontal parallel lines on the body, which might resemble the horizontal groups of lines that we see on the body of the figure on our vase. Well, Cariorgis, in a later publication of the um, pictorial pottery from Rashamra, uh, Ugarit compared the shirt that we see on the right the figure on this shirt with the figure on the Ayaparskavi vase on the left. And it's interesting because the figure on the right from Ugarit, he was much more willing to accept as something anthropomorphic rather than uh, a, 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 a uh, image that was derived strictly from Mycenaean floral forms. But interestingly, this one has even more in common with the voluted flower and the hybrid form than the vase from Ayaparaskavi, because here, in fact, we do see that the uh, breasts are indicated with these downward facing volutes and the arms do turn downward. However, I, as I mentioned, and certainly from the title of this paper, would argue that despite the uh, beliefs of Cariorgis and Ramul and Louise Steele and uh, Sarah Imovar that this was not a representation of a cult statue. I, in fact, believe that that's exactly what we're seeing. And uh, some of the reasons that I think that it does represent a cult image is that it's frontal, whereas the other images that we see on Mycenaean pictorial vases are uh, horizontal, uh, are, sorry, in profile. Uh, these, as you can see, are depicted frontally, uh, you know, although the faces are in profile, and they are immobile. They are, certainly the figure on the left seems to be entirely stationary, whereas the figures in the chariot vases, uh, the chariots are, are, are moving. And in fact, on many of these vases of the pictorial style, we do see movement in, of the figures. Cariorgis and Vermeule also observed that the figure of uh, the, on the right, whom I'm uh, uh, identifying as a cult statue, is identical to the figures in the uh, sitting, the, the chariot driver and the rider, uh, certainly in terms of the rendering of their heads. But I would also uh, disagree with that because in fact, what we're seeing uh, is that the figure on the right has a forelock, although it's not entirely preserved. You could see two bits of it. And here I've just done a rather primitive looking uh, reconstruction of this forelock. And there's a backlock. She has, you could see the back of her hair right there uh, extends with this lock behind her neck. Um, and so, I think that there are these differences that are significant, although we really don't know what that forelock means. Uh, it appears on La Parisienne, it appears on a number of different images. It's, it's most likely something having to do with status. It might have some sort of ritual uh, associations. That I don't know, but it certainly does distinguish this figure from the others. And we should also note that her hands are open and her fingers are splayed. The second figure is uh, perhaps even more 
difficult to um, to compare uh, and to make sense out of is, is certainly in terms of the hairstyle and the facial painting. Um, and in fact, Kariorgis in his discussion of this piece was really sort of at a loss to describe or, or to, uh, to understand what was going on here. But I think that the answer is in the fee figurine. And if you look at, especially when we look at a fee figurine um, in profile, you could see that it does have this outline for the jawline and the hair is very similar. It is a very short hairstyle. What this represents, who this represents, whether it is another goddess that has this distinctive appearance is certainly something that uh, I'm really hard pressed to uh, identify. But I, I certainly think that, that, that the resemblance to the fee figurine is worth pointing out. Um, and also, it's on this vase from uh, Kalavasos, uh, another Mycenaean vase that was found on Cyprus, where we see rather unusually the downturned arm gesture. And it's the arms turning downward that is really unusual. Um, I don't know any other renderings of the human figure on pictorial pottery that have this gesture. And of course, I'll be very happy to hear anyone who has anything to add to this after the talk. But I would also like to just throw out the idea that maybe the fee figurine is depicted with its arms curving downward. And if we were to imagine the figure on the left that were to be clothed and wearing some sort of draped garment, the outline of it, uh, especially if it were belted at the waist, would certainly resemble that of the fee figurine. Well, what I would like to now turn our attention to is some of the evidence for cult statues. When we speak of cult statues, obviously we're talking about a statue of a divinity that receives some form of veneration. I rather almost humorously uh, show the replica, the, this replica in, in the Nashville Parthenon of Phidias's Athena Parthenos. And I know certainly there is a great deal of controversy regarding whether or not we think of the Athena Parthenos as in fact a cult statue or whether it was simply the treasury of the city of Athens and the actual cult statue was the Xoanon located in the Hecatompodon. But I show it here uh, anyway, just um, to give you a sense of scale because in fact, the figures that we're looking at on these um, Mycenaean vases are unlikely to be anything close to the scale that we see here of the Phidian statue. So let's just take a look then at the evidence that has been brought to light uh, that might uh, refer to cult statues. And, and the first one is this vase from Festos, uh, this Camaris vase, Middleman owned two vase. And as you can see, there are these two dancing figures that seem to be flanking this very stationary immobile figure uh, who is lacking any arms. And I think that this has been reasonably identified as a cult image, perhaps a Xoanon. Xoanon are again, one of these very controversial topics. I mean, the references to Xoanon are, are, belong to the seventh century AD, uh, but, Certainly, I think that it is very possible that we're talking about wooden images uh, that have something like a plank form, which is the usual definition of a xoanon. And in fact, if we were to compare this uh, bowl with the closest looking representation, that is the so-called fruit stand also from Festos, you can see that there really is a difference between the figure in the middle uh, of the uh, Festos bowl and the figure uh, in the center of the stand, uh, she has hands and she's holding flowers, the figure on the left. And so I think that interpretations of her as being perhaps a goddess, and maybe we're seeing an epiphany of the goddess with these figures, dancing around the figure is something uh, quite possible. Uh, and that's certainly not to deny the likelihood, the possibility though, that the figure on the right is in fact a statue, perhaps a statue of the goddess who we see rendered on the figure on the left. Well, perhaps the best physical evidence for Xoanon was discovered by Effie and Yanni Sakalarakis at Archanes Anemospilia, uh, a deposit that has been dated to the middle of the 3A period, um, although I know there's certainly controversy with that. And the evidence is based on the discovery of these two clay feet. 
I will mention that there are also a pair of, uh, there's a pair of feet uh, from Malia, rather smaller, and a single one from Gurdia. Um, Yanni and Effie reconstructed the feet uh, as inserted into the bottom of a log of like a Xoanon. You see these wonderful drawings that we see here. I must say though that there was a lot of uh, skepticism when this was first presented. And I think that most of the doubt or skepticism lie in the fact that no one thought that these two clay feet could support something as heavy as a log. Um, and so I would suggest that it's still very possible that we're talking about a xoanon with the feet inserted uh, into the bottom of the log, but rather than uh, e expecting that the entire statue rested on these two feet, perhaps what we are seeing here is that there were certainly these feet, but that in fact, the uh, figure was surrounded by a garment that also rested on the ground, and maybe even the thick white lines that we see on either side of the figure on this uh, vase are reference to a wooden structure or armature underneath the garment that helped support the figure. Well, next in our survey would be the snake, so-called snake goddesses. And I think that, um, and which have been most recently dated to the middle of the 3B period, um, jo Bernice Jones has most recently looked at these with uh, great attention, and I, I think that her conclusions are correct, and that is that it's the apron that is perhaps the most significant attribute that we see here, and the apron might in fact identify these figures as priests rather than as divinities and priests who do all sorts of things like sacrifice animals and and, 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 and poor libations and, and anointments. And so uh, the apron, I think, uh, makes very good sense for them. And so I think that we should, can then perhaps dismiss the possibility that these are actually um, cult statues. Well, when it comes to a cult statue, I think probably the safest and most certain uh, piece of evidence that we have is the Chris Elephantine uh, statue from Pale Castro known as the Kuros, which was found in a late Minoan 1B context, but possibly was carved somewhat earlier in late Minoan 1A. But as you can see, this statue, which stands about, oh, 35 centimeters in height, um, is made, carved out of ivory, although in the most uh, recent final restoration before the vase was, uh, before the object, sorry, was placed uh, in the exhibition, the gold that was found on in various parts of the piece has been now fully restored. And I think based on the rather random distribution of gold on the arm, on the legs, and also in the armpit, I think we can conclude that in fact, originally this statue was covered with gold leaf. Uh, whether the head uh, was covered with gold. And you can see that the, the scalp is made out of stone. This magnificent carving of this braid down the center is something that can be debated, although based on its similarity to relief stone vases, which very likely were also covered with gold leaf, it's, it's possible, in fact, that the entire statue was originally covered with gold leaf. Now, whether it is a a, a fancy uh, rendering of the common uh, terracotta image of these young males that we see uh, from the commonly and the at the uh, peak sanctuary at Petsofa, which is the peak sanctuary of Pale Castro, or whether the uh, terracotta images are imitating the cult statue, I, I really can't debate that. But certainly, one sees a tremendous a, a similarity in the pose here of the two figures, and certainly the hairstyle. Uh, identifies this figure as a youth rather than a mature figure, whether uh, we, I mean, we certainly can't identify what divinity uh, this represents, but I think it's certainly uh, without doubt that it does represent in a, a divinity. It was found in the, part of it was found in the building off to the right, building five, which has been identified as a shrine. Although when it was plundered, the statue was broken and pieces of it were found in the uh, area in front of the building. Well, somewhat more speculative, let's say, in terms of the evidence for cult statues are these three bronze locks or these three bronze objects 
that we see on the left side, which Arthur Evans believed did come from a, as he calls it, a gigantic female figure. Um, it was found actually just to the north of the uh, East Hall. Um, the, what we see in the center here is Evans' drawing of the locks, how he thought they may have originally looked, and his reconstruction of a statue with these locks. And it was really these hair locks that caused quite a bit of discussion in the late 1970s, uh, especially uh, by Nano Marinatos and Robin Haig, who examined these locks and came to the conclusion that in fact, they had nothing to do with the cult statue. And in fact, in a very seminal article that uh, they wrote, they denied the existence of cult statues in the Aegean Bronze Age. And I have to say that that article had a really profound influence on the thinking of Aegean scholars for several decades. And I, I think, in fact, even to this date, there is really a lot of skepticism regarding the existence of cult statues in the Aegean, although perhaps now with this, the discovery of the Palais Castro Kouros, things have changed and, and there is a much more positive uh, positive belief in their existence. I also do want to mention that in the East Hall is where Evans also found these large um, plaster reliefs of athletes. And I wonder if somehow these are connected. This is something that I would like someday very much to work on. And perhaps I could convince Colin McDonald to study this deposit with me. Well, another um, rather speculative and uncertain, certainly, but, but rather compelling uh, artifact from Canossus is this stone wig, which Evans was quite convinced belonged to a sphinx. And in fact, he compared it to images of sphinxes that we know from Anatolia. And he believed, in fact, that the hairstyle that we see depicted on this stone wig is the Hathor hairstyle that we see on the um, relief uh, entrance from Alajahuyuk and also on the Ajahuyuk ivories. Um, and what I would like to suggest here today, in fact, is that we can perhaps find a comparison for this wig, but it's not Anatolia, but rather it is the Near East, uh, is Mesopotamia. In fact, specifically maybe Syria and to the Western part of Mesopotamia, to the Amorite world. And what I'm uh, showing you here are these three terracotta plaques that uh, all date to the um, old Ab Babylonian period or to the Amorite period. Um, that is to say, towards the end of the Middle Bronze Age or the 18th century, um, they all represent the goddess Ishtar, who is identified by her attribute, and that is the lion whose back she stands on. And although she's wearing a crown that has these inward facing horns, which identifies her as a divinity, you can also see that her hair sticking out from underneath the crown does end in these thick and rounded sections, very much like we see on the stone wig from Canossus. In fact, even clearer uh, and closer is this image of the goddess of ever flowing waters that comes from the palace of Mari, uh, also dated to the 18th century, uh, the palace of Zimri Lim, an Amorite. Um, in fact, interestingly, the if you look at the back part of the hair, and I unfortunately don't have a back view, but you could see that the hair in the back is parted in the center, very similarly in the way that the hair is parted in the back of the uh, statue of this goddess here. And so again, I think that we are talking about uh, perhaps a Near Eastern inspiration. However, the absence of the horn crown, uh, I think, tells us that this is not an import from the Near East. And in fact, what I would like to propose is that this is a Minoan statue of a divinity that perhaps looks very similar to the goddesses that we see on these other images. And notice too, the one on the right is wearing the flounced skirt, which as Bernice Jones has shown, is uh, a Minoan garment that undoubtedly comes from the Amorite world. 
but yet because she's not wearing the horned uh, helmet, I suspect that this might be a Minoan statue that was carved in emulation of a Near Eastern idea, but that in fact, uh, the stone itself, which we see used for stone vases, uh, is indigenous Minoan. And I think that the carving itself, again, is probably Minoan, but, um, but very much uh, emulating this uh, Near Eastern type. Well, the last Minoan possibility I would like to throw out, and here, it, it, and when I say throw out, I mean, I, I really like people's opinions, but these are two stone objects. They're about 12 inches in length, and that had been on my mind for a long time. The one on the left is um, somebody's, oh no. Somebody is now bombarding my images with yellow lines. Could you, could you please unshare your screen, Robert, and then share sure. it again? Then we'll okay, we'll try that. How do I unshare the screen? Oh, stop share. Stop share. Oh, okay. Let's try it again. Ah, we're back. Great. I don't want to leave the meeting. Hold on. Let's see. Okay, great. So, um, we still can't see your screen. Oh, huh. Okay, hold on, because I see it. Try Let's... again, please. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Let's... One second. Escape. Okay. Ah, slideshow. Is your PowerPoint still on? Uh, open? Yeah. Yeah, okay. What about? Hold on. I don't have a, I don't see where it says show uh, share uh, at, screen. At, at the very bottom the, of your screen, yeah. uh, somewhere in the middle, share screen. Yeah, I know. That's where it should be. You can't see it? No. Hold on. Yeah, I think it's a, uh, okay. Can you wait a second? Oh, no. you, 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 don't, you don't need to, to fiddle with any of that. Just uh, can you open so that you can see in front of your screen your PowerPoint? Then we can all see it. I can see my PowerPoint. Oh. Um, That's the thing. Let me go to slideshow. Yes, please. Current slide. How about now? Not Are you seeing yet. anything? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, oh man let's go you know what i think maybe let me just x out and start again all right i i think we are seeing okay i've got a message on um on chat we can yeah. see somebody else's screen actually i didn't realize that so this the screen that currently appears uh, in our uh, screens is somebody else's. So could the person who has shared his screen and share it, please? Yeah, that's what's blocking mine. Yeah. Uh, wait, now I'm... Sh I don't believe this. Right, okay. That, now what's happening? Can you try sharing again? Okay, hold on. Wait. Uh, no, that's the meaning. Um, Where, slideshow. I don't have a share screen sign. No, go back to that. To, to the what? That you were showing before. Okay, yeah. Farasi, what are you seeing? We we could see your screen now, uh, but not your PowerPoint. Can you uh, again? Can you try to bring back to your screen your uh, PowerPoint? How about now? No. No. Okay. Oh. <sighs> Let's see. Wow. I think I might leave the meeting and come back. No, it's somebody else. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. um, sh shall we leave, uh, leave the meeting and connect again, Mr. Yeah, Cohen? I think that's the thing I have to do. Yeah. 
Okay. I thought it was Robert's screen. No, it's not. Okay. Sorry about that. We'll, we'll fix it shortly. Στον είναι ε, μπορείς να κάνεις co-host τον ε, ομιλητή μας όταν θα ξαναπείς το... Mm -hmm. ε, ναι, ναι. Α, ah, I'm unmuted. Now you can hear me. Let's see. Hi, Robert. Okay, hi. You cannot start your video because the host has stopped my video. Uh, can you try again to share your screen? Your sure. Yeah. Let's see. Hold on. Yeah, you need to open it. Great. You may also switch. How are we now? Camera. Yes, we can see it. You can. Okay, great. Choose, choose slideshow. Jeez. Can you choose slideshow and uh, Wait. switch on your screen? Uh, this this is blocking my ah, slideshow. Okay. From well, let's just say. <coughs> From current slide. Okay. Right. Okay. So we're we back. Yes, we are. Okay. Let me just get this out of here. No, they can see me. So, are we back? We are. You may uh, switch on your cameras as well if you wish. Oh, my camera is not on. We can't see you. Uh... Oh, right. You can't see me. Well, that's all right. Hold on. Uh, where'd it go? Where's my camera? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ah, okay. Start with yeah. Keep it. No, keep it there. There we go. Yeah, right. I'm back. Okay. Yeah. All right. Shall we continue? Yes, please. Uh, slideshow again. And okay, we oh, slideshow. From current slide. No. Hold on. Slideshow. Current slide. Yep. Okay. That's right. We We're back. Have... Yeah. Thank you. Josh. I'm so sorry, everyone, but you know. So, okay, back to these two pieces. Um, hold on. Let me just eliminate that. So, uh, let me just, yeah. So I, I, the, there are these two pieces here that um, one from Tillisos, one from Ayatriada that do uh, depict sphinxes and they have holes in their back. And I, as I say, I've, I've just never really been satisfied with, uh, with with Evan's explanation. He compared them to um, this inkwell, uh, which is a type that's known again from uh, early Amorite culture. This one is from Larsa, um, and, and it, it shows this mastiff with this uh, stone cup coming out of its back. And Evans, I think, and, and Evans 
believe that maybe that's what we're seeing here is that these are inkwells. But what I would like to suggest actually is that this is the base for a cult statue. And we know from the Near East that uh, very often images of divinities, uh, statues of divinity, or divinities were, were, uh, uh, were, were conceived of as standing on the back of the animal which, to which, with which they were associated. And so here we see this silver pendant from Kalavasos that shows the Stutzgat, the um, protective deity on the back of a ram. And um, also from uh, Yazalakaya in Anatolia, we see these twin goddesses on the back of this uh, eagle, double-headed eagle. And I'm wondering if perhaps that's why we see then these two holes cut into the back of this sphinx here that in fact, it might represent uh, a double statue for two cult images. But what I will say, in complete uh, transparency. And that is many years ago when I first started thinking about this, I had a long chat with Edith Parada, the great Edith Parada. We went to her apartment, we pulled books off of the shelves. After two hours of looking for parallels, she turned to me and said, well, you know, I think this is a very interesting idea, but I could find absolutely no evidence to support it. So if any of you do have any thoughts about these uh, fascinating statues and how they may originally have been used, I would be perfectly delighted to hear your thoughts on them. In recent years, Athanasia Kanda has found what she thinks might be evidence for two different xona in her excavations in the town of Canossus, one of them dating to late Minoan one, uh, uh, is based on her discovery of these gold leaf uh, pieces from a, a room in uh, the, uh, the sanctuary, room three, which she thinks may have been fitted over an, a stone, uh, sorry, a wooden uh, sculpture looking rather like the vases that we see uh, on the screen here on this slide. And she also found in the fetish shrine a compartment uh, against the wall uh, in which uh, she found chunks of charcoal and again uh, believed that this might be the support for a Xonon uh, in the fetish shrine. So the point is, is that there is uh, increasing uh, thoughts, evidence, or beliefs at least, that cult statues were very much part of Minoan culture. And uh, I would just also like to show, of course, the great uh, so-called uh, goddesses with upraised arms that are known from 13th uh, and 12th century Crete uh, that were found, um, many of them on these uh, platforms or bench shrines. And uh, I know, again, this is a, an area of great controversy and debate, how these statues are to be interpreted, whether they are actually cult statues that receive veneration, whether these are uh, worshipers, whether they are priestesses or something in between, uh, is something that I really don't want to uh, get into here, although I'd be certainly happy to hear your opinions. But finally, uh, uh, in terms of the longevity of some of these images, I would just mention also this protogeometric vase, protogeometric B vase from Fortezza that shows on one side under the handles a, an image that all who have looked at this vase have identified as a goddess with upraised arms. And certainly we see the resemblance to the figure on the uh, Chesnola vase that we've been talking about. But even uh, more pertinent, I think, is the image on the opposite side. And what we see here is another goddess, presumably, but in this case, her arms are facing downward, rather like the image uh, of the perhaps cult statue that we see on the vase from Ugarit. And quite uh, remarkably, she seems to be standing on a cart that is pulled by wheels uh, and flanked by these trees. And in this case, Nano Maranatos, who has talked about this uh, image, has in fact suggested that we are looking at a cult statue, a cult statue that would have been placed, uh, that would have been stored in a building and then wheeled out into an outdoor sanctuary as we see perhaps uh, depicted on this vase. 
And finally, uh, from the Yamalaki's collection, this uh, shrine model, which probably also is proto-geometric B in date of the ninth century, that seems in fact to depict what I think uh, it's hard to deny is most likely a rendering of a cult statue that's being observed by these two shepherds and their dog uh, from the roof. Well, if we turn to the Mycenaean world, the evidence for cult statues is also rather uh, ambiguous, let's say, but, but perhaps um, the pendulum again is shifting in the direction that objects that uh, might ordinarily have not been identified as cult statues, in fact, are just that, are cult statues. And of, of course, I'm referring to the plaster head that we see on the left, the so-called sphinx or female head, and the terracotta figures that we see on the right uh, that are all wheel made uh, and fairly large scale for a terracotta figure, that is to say about 25 centimeters in height. Well, in fact, the discussion uh, and the identification of these terracotta statues as cult images was uh, really uh, brought into focus by Colin Renfrew in his excavations on the island of Milos of the sanctuary of Philacopi, where he found this image, uh, this, this figure uh, that he referred to as the Lady of Philacopi, um, and he identified her as a cult statue, uh, perhaps because of the work involved in the painting of the statue. There is labor involved in it. It's not Chris Elephantine, of course, but it is something quite remarkable, even in terms of manufacturing techniques. Um, and, and he thought that it was a focal point, that it was unique, and that it certainly was something that received veneration from worshipers who came in to the shrine. And of course, this brought then uh, into question the identification of the hundred or so other um, terracotta figures that we now know about, which have been beautifully studied by Vaso Pliatsika, who has done, uh, I'd say, superb work on studying these figures. Um, the one on the right we see from Mycenae, from the cult center at Mycenae, uh, and the ones in the center from various uh, places uh, in the Mycenaean world. Most of them, as you can see, have their arms raised. That is the common gesture. Uh, they certainly do remind us of the psi figurine in the raising of the hands, but these are certainly very different. They are hollow, they are wheel made, cylindrical, and they show a great amount of detail, especially with regard to their facial features and their garments and their, um, their jewelry. The one on the left was found with this group of other figures, large scale, terracotta wheel made figures that uh, this entire deposit has been subject to a great deal of discussion. Um, at this point, I think because of their similarity, the dark painted ones are not regarded as cult images, although some of them do appear to have attributes, but rather these are thought perhaps to be uh, images of worshipers that may have been carried in procession, whereas the figure on the left, and as you can see it in the center image here, does stand out as being special and uh, may well in fact have been the cult statue for the temple in which these were found. And one does not have to associate all of these objects as being used on the same occasion. We see more of these uh, terracotta wheel made statues from Tiryns, as you see here in this tiny little shrine uh, in the Unterberg. Again, with these figures with their arms raised upwards. Um, and in fact, it, the upraised arm gesture certainly does remind us of the figure on the Ayaparaska Vives. But what I'd also like to point your attention to are her breasts. Oddly enough, when Kariorgi published the uh, shirt from Ugarit, he doubted their gender. And he in fact thought that there was no reason to show breasts with such a fancy looking spiral form and thought in fact that they might not even be females. But I think that if we look at the figure on the right from Medea, where we could see these concentric circles painted on her breasts and even the figure on the right with, uh, on the left, the outline breasts on the figure from Tiryns, I, I think that this certainly does provide, let's say a three-dimensional 
parallel for the painting of the spiral patterns on the breasts of the uh, figure on the Eye of Paraskevi vase. Well, the one object that has really uh, caused the most amount of agreement, let's say, in terms of its rendering as a cult statue is the plaster female head from Mycenae. Although there is a question about whether it represents a female or whether it represents a, a, a sphinx. And uh, I would say that the evidence to identify it as a sphinx uh, is, is really not all that convincing. And primarily because um, the sphinxes that we do see from the Mycenaean world invariably have this long plume emanating from the top of their heads, whereas that's not the case with this figure. She is not wearing a plume, her head is flat, but I think what we are seeing here is a connection to the terracotta uh, statues of these females that, as I said, I think are cult statues, and it's particularly in the facial ornamentation. As we see the figure on the left, the plaster head does have these three rosettes on her cheeks and one on her chin. Uh, in a similar way, we see rosettes painted on the figure from Mycenae, uh, although she has solid paint on her chin. Similarly, we see rose, uh, lozenges painted on the face of this other figure from Mycenae and uh, connecting it with the um, figure from Philocopi would be certainly the painting on her chin, which connects her, I think, iconographically to the statue from Mycenae. Uh, the question then that remains with these is how this statue may have originally looked. The late Paul Rehack thought it was a seated statue uh, based on comparisons with this image of the seated goddess from uh, the Tiran's ring. But I think that it's more likely considering the associations with the facial features that we've mentioned with these terracotta statues um, from Mycenae that I think it's more likely that she would have been standing. And in fact, we do know that there was a dowel hole in the bottom of the statue's head that would have indicated that in fact it was connected with a, a lower body. The statue itself was found uh, in the vicinity of Shrine Gama. Uh, this is, uh, it was found by Tsuntas in uh, 1896. Um, Milanas has studied the fine spot and has suggested that in fact it did come from the cult center in the area of Shrine Gama. And so one can imagine that it was stored uh, inside the building or perhaps inside of Tsuntas's house. And then as we saw on the cart from Festos, uh, from, from Fortezza, sorry, wheeled out at the time uh, that it was venerated. This head, which has recently been published by Andreas Vlachopoulos and Eleni Paleologu, uh, uh, has been very often overlooked. It's smaller than the head from the cult center. This one was found in the vicinity of the palace at Mycenae. Um, both of them have argued that it is a female. Uh, we can see that from the white paint uh, that remains from it, on the plaster. Her hairstyle is very similar. She has a ponytail at the back, uh, also a diadem paint on her lips and also possibly uh, black paint on her chin. So I think what we're seeing here perhaps then is a smaller cult statue. And this one also, in fact, has a dowel hole and you can see it's been used for the mounting of this plexiglass rod so that there would have been a lower body. This third one from Aspromata, um, a cemetery outside of Mycenae, is smaller than all the others. Um, like the statue from Mycenae, its breasts, are, as you can see, are covered by its hands, or in this case, cut by its hands. It's, as I say, it's smaller than the other two plasters, but it, yet it also was made with a wooden armature. I just don't know how we can interpret this, although its context is interesting because it was found in a grave with, I think, 16 other small sea figurines and with what uh, has been described as a platform, suggesting that in fact it may have been mounted on a platform. And so I'm wondering if in fact the burial 
uh, was that of a priest, someone who uh, would, for whom these cult statues would have certainly been very meaningful. In terms of linear B evidence, I would just mention that there is this one uh, word that uh, has appeared, Teoporija, which means carrying the gods. Uh, Stefan Hiller wrote a brilliant article on this uh, word, suggesting that it does in fact represent a festival, a festival where statues of the gods were carried. This is uh, mentioned in two linear B tablets. And what I'm showing below, certainly not Minoan or Mycenaean, it is uh, a relief from the palace of Nimrud, but it does show statues of gods being carried off. In this case, a rather bellicose context, it's Assyrians uh, carrying off the gods from temples in Syria. And you see on the left, a standing statue of the storm god Adad. But the point is that I, I just wanted you to see what it might look like to carry off statues of divinities. Well, the last thing that I'd like to then talk about is the consumption or the reception of this vase. And that is, would the Cypriot who received this vase and who eventually put it in their tomb would have understood what was actually happening on this vase? Um, and I think that in fact, the answer has to be yes, that they would have known that I think it would have been in fact, uh, preposterous to think that they would have been uh, in the dark, would have had no idea what these rather compelling images looked like, uh, what, what these compelling images meant. And interestingly, um, a number of the pictorial style vases that have been found on Cyprus are marked on the bottom, marked with a marking that we think was painted probably before firing, and although that's debated, and whether or not this mark indicates that these were destined for export to Cyprus is also debated, but it's a possibility that in fact, these pot marks did indicate that these were meant for the export market. Certainly cult statues were familiar to Cypriots. We have two great examples of in bronze, the horn god and the ingot god, both of them from Enkomi. Uh, both found in sanctuaries, and both of them have been regarded by all who have studied this material as, represent, as cult statues, statues of divinities that would have been venerated. Furthermore, I think it's very well known that a number of Aegean ritual cult elements were absorbed into Cypriot society. Uh, I would mention only the wonderful faience riton that Vasos found at Kidion, and certainly the Horns of Consecration, also from Kidion, and the Horns of Consecration in this altar from Mirtu Pigavis. And so to absorb another element like an Aegean cult statue into Cypriot culture would not have been entirely alien. And I would also, in this context, like to mention then uh, the Kalavasos vase that we talked about earlier, which Athadasiya Kanda has uh, made this uh, very wonderful reconstruction, reconstruction, sorry, of the shrine that was depicted on this vase, again, uh, showing very clear Aegean elements. And I would also, of course, like to point out that this is one of the only other representations of a figure with the arms turning downward. Whether this represents a cult image or the priestess of the shrine is something that we really can't say. But I would also like to mention that the whole idea that cult statues were venerated in outdoor shrines, in outdoor settings, is something that also would certainly have been very familiar to Cypriots. And I would only mention the, uh, the, the planted garden that uh, Vasos Kariorgis uh, believed was uh, present between the two temples at Kirion, as you see to the right, and certainly the large courtyard area at Mirtu Pagadis, which could also very well have accommodated an outdoor cult statue of the sort that we see on this vase. And so what I would find, like to conclude is that what I think what we can see are three episodes in the veneration of the cult statue that are depicted on these two vases. On the left, we see the arrival at the Temenos, and I would just draw your attention to this vertical uh, line of incurved arcs that might in fact be meant to separate 
the secular from the religious sphere, uh, separating the outside world from the world of this religious uh, outdoor sanctuary. In the vase from Ugard, I think we see the chariot rider who has dismounted. And off to the left, you could just see a bit of the chariot uh, cart uh, who has dismounted and is approaching a cult statue for veneration. And on the far right, we see then the departure after the statue has been venerated, rather than in fact, uh, to quote Vermeul, see that they, that no one would turn their back on a, god, on a goddess, I would rather say that instead of uh, imagining that they're turning their back on their goddess, rather it's, I, I would use the uh, American expression, the goddess has their back. In other words, the goddess is protecting them as they're leaving the sanctuary. And so I would just then thank you all for your attention and hope that, well, the goddess protects all of us. So thanks again for your attention and so sorry about that technical glitch in the middle of it. Thank you. What a fascinating lecture and uh, what a, an intriguing topic, which I'm sure, uh, which actually reminds me of uh, why in, I initially wanted to study the Aegean Bronze Age. It didn't happen, but it's still uh, a fascinating uh, area of study.